I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Since the earliest days of Hollywood, notable figures and incidents of the Old West have been memorably captured in cinema. No list would be complete without the story of renowned lawman Wyatt Earp and the events surrounding the fabled gunfight at the O.K. Corral and the vendetta ride that followed. The 1993 western Tombstone again put that story on the screen, giving actor Kurt Russell one of his most iconic performances as Wyatt Earp, along with Val Kilmer's unforgettable and quotable turn as Doc Holliday. I've not yet begun to defile myself. While Tombstone is now considered a classic of the genre, the trail through production was fraught with drama, from rewrites to rushed scheduling to revolving crew. Strap on your six guns and saddle up as we find out what the fuck happened to this movie. Westerns were a reliable movie staple from the early days of cinema right through the 1970s, a decade that featured successes like Clint Eastwood's The Outlaw Josie Wales and Robert Redford's Jeremiah Johnson. But by the 1980s, the Western had fallen out of favor in Hollywood, the repercussions of the infamously expensive dud Heaven's Gate. There were a few exceptions that rode onto screens during the 1980s, but it was a pair of high-profile hits in the early 90s that started to breathe some life and confidence back into the Western genre. Kevin Costner's Oscar-winning Dances with Wolves and Clint Eastwood's Oscar winner, Unforgiven. Around this time, screenwriter Kevin Jarre was working on an epic western of his own. Jarre had written the Oscar-winning Civil War drama, Glory, and had previously dabbled in the Old West with the 1988 Chris Christopherson HBO movie, Dead or Alive. He wanted to make a sprawling, authentic western, and spent nearly a year on his first draft. Historical consultant Jeff Morey, who had assisted Jarre with research, said that his script redefined the western film. The Tombstone screenplay also made an impression on A-list Hollywood talent, namely Kevin Costner. But the actor wanted to shift the focus more onto Wyatt Earp rather than all of the secondary characters that were prominent throughout Jarre's script. So Costner decided to mosey on, instead choosing to make a competing movie with Lawrence Kasdan, who had previously directed him in Silverado. The script for Tombstone made its way into the hands of Kurt Russell, who thought it was phenomenal and wanted to take the lead role. But the project was already in rocky territory. After a series of hits in the late 80s and the statues he collected for Dances with Wolves, Kevin Costner was also riding high on the colossal success of the 1992 romantic thriller The Bodyguard. He had earned a lot of power in Hollywood, and he wasn't afraid to wield it, using that A-list clout to stonewall Tombstone's casting and studio avenues. Tombstone wasn't the beginning of Kurt Russell's rivalry with Kevin Costner. A few years earlier, he had narrowly missed out on the lead role in Bull Durham which Costner landed despite Russell's actual experience as a minor league baseball player. But Kurt Russell's faith in the Kevin Jarre script urged him forward. He navigated the Hollywood politics as best he could and approached Andy Vina for financing. Vina, who had produced the Rambo movies and Total Recall, agreed to a $25 million budget through his Synergy Pictures, with Kevin Jarre getting the opportunity to make his directing debut off the brilliance of his screenplay. Thanks to Costner's heightened influence in Hollywood, Tombstone had been left with a single option for release, Buena Vista, a subsidiary of Disney. That wasn't a big concern for Russell, who had established his acting career at the Mouse House. The casting process had gathered Sam Elliott and Bill Paxton for Wyatt's brothers Virgil and Morgan, with Powers Booth and Michael Bean as Curly Bill Brocious and Johnny Ringo, leaders of the cattle-rustling outlaws known as the Cowboys. Joining the Earps would be gambler and gunslinger Doc Holliday, played by Willem Dafoe. Wait, what? Yes, Kevin Jarre had wanted Willem Dafoe to be your Huckleberry, but Disney shot down that casting and insisted on a different actor. Andy Vina and Russell briefly considered having Kurt play Doc Holliday and bringing in Richard Gere for Wyatt, but ultimately they decided on the studio's suggestion of Val Kilmer. While Dafoe as Holiday is interesting to imagine, it's now virtually impossible to separate Kilmer from the role. I'm your Huckleberry. That's just my game. One of Jarre's inspirations when writing the script was to create a significant role for actor Lisa Zane, with whom he was romantically involved at the time and considered his muse. The pivotal role of traveling performer Josephine Marcus was written with Zane in mind, but instead the part went to Dana Delaney, who had a higher profile at the time after starring in the hit TV series China Beach. Ironically, the part of Josephine's stage colleague went to Lisa Zane's brother, Billy. The cast was filled out with other familiar faces. Stephen Lang, Michael Rooker, John Tenney, Robert John Burke, 
Look, it's Jason Priestley, John Corbett, Thomas Hayden Church, Dana Wheeler Nicholson. Hey, there's Billy Bob Thornton, Terry O'Quinn, Harry Carey Jr., Paul Ben Victor, and... You guessed it, Frank Stallone. Even screen veteran Charlton Heston makes an appearance. We would have also seen Robert Mitchum as part of the Clanton family if he hadn't suffered a horse riding injury as filming began, but the actor was still able to provide narration. Tombstone began filming in May of 1993 in Arizona, not all that far from the original town, and it was under the gun right from the start. Disney wanted Tombstone in theaters that Christmas, which put additional pressure on the movie's first-time director. Kevin Jarre was detail-oriented and dedicated to properly depicting the authenticity of the period, even demanding the actors grow their own impressive facial hair. Only John Tenney wore fake fuzz, as he was just coming off a previous acting job, and the actors were clad in period-appropriate wool, despite the brutal desert temperatures. Jarre also wanted to see the title location as a cosmopolitan boomtown, Production designer Catherine Hardwick, who would go on to direct movies like 13 and Twilight, was instructed to avoid the sepia tones of traditional westerns in favor of more rich and lively colors that were still period accurate. Have you seen how everyone dresses? Awful Tony for a mining camp. But still the specter of Kevin Costner loomed over the production. During prep, costume designer Joseph Porro had discovered that Costner's Wyatt Earp film had already snapped up most of the appropriate Western wardrobe in Hollywood, and Walter Hill's Geronimo, an American legend, had basically claimed the rest. Scrambling to meet Jarre's high expectations, Porro connected with Caravan West Productions, a group of Old West enthusiasts and consultants who had outfits so authentic that their wardrobe could serve as models for Porro to fabricate costumes. Caravan West founder Peter Shireko even appears in the movie as Texas Jack Vermillion, and his buckaroos acted as extras, using all their own gear. While Kevin Jarre was a talented screenwriter with a script that was universally praised, it was immediately apparent to the cast and crew that his skills did not translate to directing. Jarre's unwavering commitment to his vision led to a rigid posture of my way or the highway, which unfortunately meant that he wasn't particularly interested in collaborating with his cast, his department heads, or his producers. The continued rejection of input from his actors and his cinematographer was souring the atmosphere on the set. Although influenced by the work of John Ford, Jarre's visual style left something to be desired. He was taking an old-fashioned approach with his camera, shooting scenes with a leisurely pace and from a considerable distance. The lack of close-ups and alternate footage for editing led to concerns with an already apprehensive money man. The general feeling was that Jar wasn't effectively capturing his script's energy or providing the footage that would be necessary for a commercial modern film. It became increasingly clear that the first-time director wasn't adjusting his stance or listening to advice. He even rejected assistance from filmmaker John Milius, his friend and mentor. After four weeks of shooting, Kevin Jar was unceremoniously dismissed from Tombstone. But the studio wasn't budging from their planned Christmas release date. Die Hard director John McTiernan was also considered, but wanted a two-week shutdown to prepare. With only a couple of days' notice, director George P. Cosmatos was brought in to take over the production. Cosmatos was considered a shooter who had previously worked on Rambo First Blood Part II and Cobra. His explicit instructions were to complete Tombstone on schedule. Working with Kilmer and producer Jim Jacks, Russell slashed pages from the script to meet the deadline. While he reduced his own presence, many additional nuance moments with the Cowboys also disappeared. Gone was an entire early sequence where Billy Clanton steals Wyatt Earp's horse, which unexpectedly leads to Wyatt entering a truce with Curly Bill and the Cowboys. Also among the casualties was a scene that Jarre had filmed himself, where Johnny Ringo confronts Charlton Heston's rancher while he's protecting the ailing Doc Holliday. Other scenes that ended up on the cutting room floor included additional moments between Wyatt and Maddie, and Doc Holliday and Kate along with the fate of Michael Rooker's character. The cast, who had gravitated to Jarre's original masterwork, weren't entirely pleased with the aggressive rewrites and the movie's newly centered focus on the relationship between Wyatt and Doc. Sam Elliott felt that the edits removed vital connective tissue and character development, and said that if he had initially been presented with that final version of the script, he would have passed on it. On set, the replacement director's behavior was, allegedly, crass, abusive, and volatile. Crew members left in droves, or were fired outright by Cosmatos. Oscar-nominated cinematographer William Fraker, who had worked on everything from Rosemary's Baby to War Games, clashed constantly with his new director, even quitting the production on three separate occasions before eventually completing the film. One heated altercation between Fraker and Cosmatos reportedly involved them plowing their golf carts into each other. The actors didn't seem to be big fans either. 
Michael Bean recently claimed that his only interactions with Cosmatos were an initial hello and later told him to f*** off. In his memoir, unsurprisingly titled, I'm your huckleberry. Val Kilmer bluntly describes the overall situation as an unholy mess. But despite Cosmatos' uncivil personality and approach, he did get the movie finished. Kurt Russell, who had championed the project from the start, would act as a unifying force for the actors through the remainder of the shoot, earning their trust at the expense of his own screen time. After 88 days of shooting and a couple extra million dollars on the budget, principal photography on Tombstone wrapped at the end of August 1993. It would be many years after the movie's release that Russell revealed the extent of his efforts to complete Tombstone. In a 2006 interview with True West magazine, he admitted that he had unofficially taken control of the movie, dictating each day's shot list to Cosmatos and secretly steering the director during filming. As Russell puts it, George and I had sign language going on. Cosmatos had been suggested to the actor by his Tango and Cash co-star Sylvester Stallone, who apparently had a similar arrangement with the director on First Blood Part II and Cobra. Thanks to their talent and experience, the on-screen cast actually needed little direction from Cosmatos, and were driven by their belief in the project and the leadership of Russell, and the actor was stretching himself thin wearing numerous hats besides the flat-brimmed Stetson of Wyatt, sleeping an average of four hours each night. Russell says that getting the movie finished was the hardest work of his life. Most of what Kevin Jarre filmed in his four weeks did not make the final cut. For Jarre, Tombstone wouldn't be his first major Hollywood disappointment, or his last. Before losing his grip on Wyatt Earp, Jarre's Dracula project got a stake through its heart when Francis Ford Coppola announced his own version of the mythical vampire in the early 90s. Then, his script for the 1997 crime thriller The Devil's Own was essentially obliterated during a troubled production. Jarre's final screen credit appears on the Stephen Summers 1999 horror adventure The Mummy. He passed away in 2011. Although altered in style and truncated in scope from his original vision, Kevin Jarre's love letter to the Old West did ultimately make it to screens. Opening against popular movies like Mrs. Doubtfire and The Pelican Brief, the R-rated Tombstone was met with decent reviews and box office over the holidays, eventually riding into the sunset with $56 million before becoming a favorite on home video. As for Kevin Costner's ostensible competitor, Wyatt Earp opened the following summer, in June of 1994, with a PG-13 rating, a runtime an hour longer than Tombstone, and a cost of $63 million. It was left in the dust with $25 million at the box office. Well... Bye. While Kurt Russell had clearly won the showdown of dueling Earps, neither actor seemed to hold a grudge, appearing together a few years later in the 2001 crime movie 3,000 Miles to Graceland. Even with all its problems and conflicts behind the scenes, the popularity of Tombstone has only grown in the years since its release, a testament to the enduring appeal of its fantastic cast and memorable scenes. Hell's coming with me! Accounts of the chaotic production may vary, but most agree that the movie's star deserves plenty of credit. As Val Kilmer stated on a 2017 blog post, I'll be clear, Kurt is solely responsible for Tombstone's success, no question. Kurt Russell, we tip our hat to you.